Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Claudio Burstein here at Biom Systems, uh, welcoming you to another online class. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about redundancy in uh, the serial systems. I'm going to start uh, by apologizing about the little background noise that we have. Uh, that is because, well, I have a couple of servers and a couple of switches right next to me, and uh, they're pretty noisy. So the microphone probably is kind of picking up uh, some of that. So just to give you an idea, well, there's my all the servers and stuff, and my microphone is like right next to right next to it. So the, what we're going to be talking today is a little bit about redundancy uh, in the serial systems. Uh, probably you know or you have seen that. Well, uh, there's multiple places where it seems like we can actually have a backup or a redundant system. So not only in the software itself where you have like little check mark that allows you to set a block to be redundant but also well there's multiple ports in the uh, in the, in the in the cards and stuff that uh, that indicate that there is something that can be done so we're going to talk about first a little bit about what is redundancy and do we need it and where do we need it and then we're going to jump directly into redundancy in the CIRA systems and we're going to look at redundancy from the inside out so we're going to start from server redundancy, basically what we do on and um, when we're talking about uh, DSP processing, and then we're going to expand to media networks. What happens on the on the edge of these processors in the in the network cards, and then how that expands even beyond the servers when you can have. Uh, redundant networks and stuff like that, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about well, what happens even beyond uh, beyond that. But first, let's talk a little bit about redundancy. And if you look anywhere, what is the concept of redundancy? It's pretty much the duplication of critical components or functions of a system, and the intention is basically increase real reliability of the system, and it's basically done by having a form of backup or failsafe. Uh, if you wanted a shorter version of that, it's pretty much trying to eliminate the single point of failure. Now, in a sound system, it depends on where we need it or, or what do we want or where that point is. And we need to ask ourselves a whole bunch of questions to define that. Well, first is, well, how critical is the system? If we're making a system that is just for background music in a store, well, can the store live without background music? Well, probably it can. So then we don't need uh, redundancy. If this is a system is for a government office or a court system, something like that, well, then it might be more critical. So once we know if the system is critical, well, we need to kind of like dig a little bit deeper and, and figure out how critical is each component of the system. Is there some components are more critical than others? It's like if something fails, it's actually going to impair the entire system. If there are other things that, well, if they fail, well, the system might not work as desired, but it will still provide the basic functionality. Then, well, which of those components will cause a complete system failure. Is there a single component that if that component fails will pretty much kill the entire system? How likely is that component to fail? Uh, it's a component that basically will never fail or it, that, that it has a high rate of failure. Those things are that we need to consider. And the other thing, well, how expensive it is to make the component or system fall, uh, completely fault tolerant. When we start thinking about uh, redundancy, we need to think, well, how much money do we want uh, do we want to spend so for instance say, let's say that we have a system that looks like this we're starting from the left uh, with some inputs those could be microphones and they go through different blocks that can be different stages of a sound system and at the end we're going to loudspeaker that are those two triangles on the on the right hand side so we could say well I can say well the single point of failure is that block right in the middle so if I want to make my system redundancy, that means that I have to duplicate that system and have a mechanism that automatically will switch from one to the other if something happens. But then I can start thinking, well, the object that is right before and right after are also a single point of failure. So maybe I need to fix those two because if any of those uh, fail, my entire system will still fail. So then I say, well, I want to duplicate those. and and. And then comes the question, well, what about the endpoints? Let's say that that microphone there or that input, whatever that block represents, is also critical and I need to duplicate that on maybe one of the outputs. So it comes to a point that if you want a fully tolerant 
or full redundant system, pretty much the solution is to duplicate the entire system and make a mechanism that will switch from one to the other if anything fails. And if we start looking at all the individual components of a sound system, uh, we're going to find that a fully fault-tolerant system may just not be an option. And there's many reasons why that would happen. It can be just impractical. There are some certain things that basically it's just not practical to create a fully tolerant system. Or it's going to be expensive. Pretty much you are trying to duplicate every single component in your system. It's going to be in a lot more complex because, well, when some devices or some, uh, um, or some pieces of that puzzle will we'll be able to have a mechanism to fail over easily. Some others, you're going to have to create your own mechanism to fail over to another one. And it will certainly require more time to design, implement, and test. So many times it is not a fully tolerant system. It might not be op the option, but yet there are certain things that we can make um, fault tolerant or redundant so the whole system doesn't, uh, doesn't fail. So we're going to look at redundancy in casino systems, and as I said, I want to look at this from the inside out. So we're going to start kind of like from the, from the very, very basic, and then we're going to expand out from the processor. Uh, and if we wanted to draw a casino system, we know that in the, in, the, in the center of that system we have the CR DSP processing. And when I say the CR DSP processing, I'm not talking about a box or a specific device. I'm talking about the actual DSP blocks that are inside a system. And uh, to that system, well, we need some local inputs and some local outputs. We need to have signals that are coming into this processing, uh, and those could be certainly local inputs that are in the same device, or local outputs that basically is like, well, once we do some processing, it goes out. But that system can also have, well, microphones and programs also that are connected to those local inputs, and you can have amplifiers or line outputs that are connected to those uh, local outputs. If you think a little bit more, kind of like more on a, on a more broader way, well, we can also have remote inputs that are connected via network, um, and remote outputs are connected via network to that DSP processing. So you could have even more inputs or more outputs that are actually located in different places, and we're actually do bringing those in uh, to the CR DSP processing, and those could be the CR expanders, for instance. Um, Probably you already know, uh, we, uh, on the website they're already announced, uh, the CR amplifiers are coming up, uh, so uh, I'm including the remote outputs of the CR amplifiers because, well, they will behave the same, um, the same way as a remote output plus some extra, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and I'm representing those blue dotted lines the same way that we do in the software with, uh, with the blue dotted lines. Those are, I mean, those are implicit AVB. So all this red stuff is still within the CIRA world, if you will. But then we can add AVB that goes in and out to other external devices. So we can still talk AVB to third-party devices because we do support AVB on 1722.1. Uh, we can support Dante, so we can talk via Dante to other devices, and we support Kubernetes, so we can actually do Kubernetes. So, and on all these networks, we can have third-party devices where we have either microphones, program sources coming in, or we have amplifiers or line outputs. So there's multiple signals coming in and out of this system that are talking directly to our Tessera system. So we're going to start. Basically, I'm going to eliminate the local inputs and the local outputs. And the reason that I'm doing that is because in Tessera, when we talk about redundancy, redundancy is only supported by the servers, not the server IOs or the Tessera Forte. So just by thinking that we want to do server redundancy, we can no longer talk about IO because we cannot host IO in those, uh, in those servers. So... In Tessera, as I said, uh, we support multiple things. We support server redundancy, and as I said, it's only on Tessera server, and that happens whenever we click this redundant uh, check mark on any block that we put in our design. So any block that we put in our design that we check this redundant check mark, we're going to make that block redundant, and it's going to be part of our redundant pair, and we're going we're gonna to see that in the software in just a minute. 
But then when we look at the different card options that we can have in a server, and actually I put the, the picture of the server I.O., uh, we see that AVB has two ports. The Dan, the, the Dan 1 card, the Dante card actually has two ports as well. And the Covenant also has two ports, the primary and secondary. So there is the, pro the provision for media network redundancy as well. So I'm going to start with the CS server redundancy. Uh, and pretty much what we're looking at right now is just the center of that picture. So we're only looking at that middle block when we're talking about basic DSP processing redundancy, how that works. And whenever as we check one block to be redundant, the program actually makes some very, very important changes to your configuration. Uh, the moment that you select the first block to be redundant, we create what is called a redundant pair. And it's, those are actually moved to a server. And in those servers, we're going to have a primary unit and a secondary unit, or a primary device and secondary device. The primary is the default device. So when we load that configuration into Tessera, the primary device is going to be the active device. I'm going to talk about active and standby in just a second. So, uh, and the secondary device, by default, is the standby device. So the secondary device is going to be loaded, but is going to be in standby. So primary and secondary only means it's like whenever you make a load or whenever you change, the primary is the one that is going to start working first. Secondary is the one that is in standby by default. But then we have the active and standby uh, definitions. The active device is pretty much, as you would imagine, the unit that is passing and processing all audio normally as per system configuration. So anything that is part of that redundant pair is being processed by um, by that uh, by that uh, device. Now all logic processing is occurring also normally so if you have any remote controls or any logic signals and stuff like that all that is being processed by the active device. Uh, and all system control levels means etc are current and authoritative. What that means is that not only if we're controlling let's say for a control system not only those changes are happening is that also those are actually going being copied out to other devices. Basically, we are the, 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 the active device basically is doing all the functionality of the system. And the active device also is acting as the proxy for remote devices. So since we probably are going to have remote to see our devices connected to this uh, redundant pair, the active device is the active proxy for all those uh, remote devices. Now the standby, the standby device is actually doing all the processing and logic processing the same way that the primary uh, device is doing it. The only difference that is that it's not producing any outputs. So it's kind of like the server is there, it's doing actually exactly the same thing as the primary is doing, but all the outputs are muted. And that's, kind of, that's probably the, the easiest way to see what is happening with the, standard, the standby device. And the other thing that the standby device is doing is that it's monitoring the active device for failures. So not only is looking at the active device via the network, there is also a connection that you need to make between the logic ports of those two uh, servers, and that allows one server to monitor the other. So if at any point the standby device doesn't see the other device, basically it assumes it has failed, it takes over, uh, it takes over the system. And it also keeps track of all control states, what is called state mirroring. So any changes that you do live to the system, let's say that you recall a preset or you change a volume or all that stuff, basically it keeps track of that. So basically all those changes are happening also in the standby device. So whenever we switch to the standby device, the standby device has the current settings, so nothing changes. The functionality continues uh, as normal. And it can also uh, respond to TTP requests. So actually, if you send a request to that device, basically you're going to get uh, you're going to get responses as well. When there is a failure, uh, the active device basically will cause automatic failure to the standard device. So the the, uh, the if the if the active device just pretty much unplugs, loses power, or dies, pretty much we don't have to do anything. But if there's any other failure that the unit is still alive but cannot process audio for any particular reason, it will fail over to the, standard, the standby device. And at that moment, the standby device becomes the active device. So it basically assumes that role and it will stay on that role. 
Now, those roles are not reversed. So for instance, when you do a failover, let's say there was a minor failure or something like that in the, the that the um, or maybe you just lost power on the primary device and it failed over to the uh, to the standby device. When you power up the primary device um, uh, again and it becomes available in the network, it's not going to switch back and become again the active device. It's actually going to power up but stay as the standby device. So those roles are not reversed. If after that the the uh, the second unit where to actually lose power, then you will switch back, and then the primary will become the active device. So whoever is active will remain active. The only way that you can actually reset and make the the primary device again the active device is by resending the configuration file to uh, the system. So I'm going to open here my software. Uh, as I said, I have a couple of units, so I can show you a couple of, a couple of things. And I am going to just create a very, very simple, um, uh, a very, very simple uh, configuration. Uh, before I do that, uh, here in my rack, actually, uh, let me uh, see if I can. Maybe you can see that a little bit better. Okay, you can see that I have two servers. Uh, I have a Tessera Forte. I have two uh, Netgear ABB switch, and I have uh, an XIO that I'm going to be using for these, uh, for these uh, tests. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put uh, two input block. I'm going to leave it to auto configure. And then I'm going to put, let's say, a just a matrix mixer, a 4x4. I'm not going to check the redundant for now. And I am going to connect this here. And I'm going to add a two-channel output block. And I'm going to connect this here. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see it better. So if I compile this, and you can see in the in the uh, compilation results here on the bottom that it says that for this I need a server I/O with one input card and one output card. So that is the normal uh, the normal thing that the compiler would do. I'm going to change this matrix, and actually I am going to make it redundant. So I'm going to go to Edit Block Parameters, and I'm going to click here where it says Redundant, and I'm going to compile that again. And now things change. The first thing that we can see is that, well, we have blue dotted lines here and blue dotted lines here. So basically, there is ABB path on the inputs and on the outputs. So the matrix is isolated. And these two, the inputs and the outputs, are actually on one device. And the matrix is on another device. And if we, if we see here the actual equipment uh, list, we see that we have an XIO, a server, that says primary, and a server, that is uh, the secondary device device uh, it, it, and, uh, and basically tells me which one which one it is so the moment that I create one single block that is um, that is redundant that's pretty much what happens we grab that block we move it away and we actually put it in a redundant uh, in a redundant pair so now I'm gonna just break these lines and I'm gonna move this a little bit farther away and I'm going to add another, let's say, I don't know, let's, let, me make, let me add like a level control, okay? And I am also going to add, I'm going to make this level control, I'm going to make it redundant, and I'm going to connect it here on the output. And I'm going to grab, I don't know, uh, let's grab a... Uh, a compressor, a two-channel compressor, but in this compressor, I'm not going to click redundant. I'm going to, I'm not going to leave it as redundant. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to put this here in the middle. So the matrix mixer in this case is redundant. The level block is redundant. I didn't set the compressor as redundant, but when I compile, you notice that I still have that ABB path on the left and on the right and all these blocks are actually in the redundant pair. Now, this block, even though it was not set as redundant, is actually in the redundant pair. And by default, every block that is allocated into the redundant pair is inherently redundant. So if that block, any block, wherever it is set to redundant or not, if it lives in the redundant pair, it is considered to be, uh, to be redundant. Now, this is happening because, well, remember that the compiler is looking for the cheapest solution. 
So we already have a server that has a lot of, of DSP capacity, so we don't need to add extra DSP processing, an extra unit to host this uh, compressor. So if we had another unit, let's say a Forte, or we had an, a server I.O. or something like that, then this compressor, since it is not redundant, it will be actually placed on that non-redundant uh, device. But since we haven't added a new device, or we don't have another device, basically it is allocated to that unit number two, and it's actually staying there. So I'm going to just add a couple of things here. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, put a, a tone generator. I'm not going to make it redundant, but I'm going to put it here in this matrix mixer, and I am going to do a uh, audio meter, and I'm going to put a peak meter, and I'm going to put one here. I'm going to put one here and one here. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to just route this tone generator to output four and then outputs one and two. So that tone generator is actually going to be going uh, to, oops, I didn't do it. Uh, it has to go to, so tone generator has to actually go to Send it to all of them. Uh, so it's pretty much going to all those meters. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to just compile this one more time, make certain that everything is good. I'm going to go to the equipment table, and I'm going to assign my devices. So I have a remote expander, so I'm going to add that. Uh, primary device, I'm going to select my Tessera server, the server number one. And the redundant server, I'm going to select server number two. And this XIO needs to be uh, proxied by one of the servers, and you can see that it, I can only set server number one. It cannot set server number two. So I'm going to send this to the devices. And we're going to see how that, uh, how that works. All right. So now I'm going to turn this sorry, to zero, and we have signal there, we have signal there, and we have signal there, as expected. So the system is running, and we actually have signals in, uh, in, in, uh, in all of our meters. So what I'm going to do is that, well, you can see, let me, let me arrange this a little bit better. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my camera here, uh, and you can see that you can see here that both servers are actually uh, are actually turned on. I'm not, I don't know if you can actually notice this server, server number one, has a green activity light. I don't the camera doesn't show it that well, but here the server number two actually has a yellow activity light, and that is because this server is actually in in standby mode. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just unplug server number two and look at the meters. I'm going to just unplug this. So I just unplug, unplug the uh, power from the server. So the server is actually losing power. You can see that power went yellow, and now all the lights are off. And now the lights change here. Look at the meters. The meters never changed. Nothing happened. And actually, in the software, I'm going to start getting some errors because, well, now I'm actually uh, lost connectivity with the, with the system. But I can see here that the system is powered. There is an alarm. Uh, but now the activity light is green, so the, the failover device actually took over. Now in the software, I'm going to get in that basically the, it failed over, that I lost communication, and now I can see here in the bottom that it says that there is a fault, and I can see here that I lost one of the servers. So basically, we just failed over to that server. It says active redundant device, not monitored by standard device, redundant cable link not connected. So it's actually detecting that something happened. Now I'm going to plug back my, my server. So the server is now powering, powering, uh, powering back up. 
And uh, once it once it's, it does, basically everything should go back to green, but we're going to notice that the server number one is the one that is going to have a, a, a yellow light, and this one is going to be actually uh, no. And if you look at the meters, meters are still where they are. We're not seeing any um, any any changes. All right, so now they're both back uh, in normal, and you can see here that the red lights went away, but this one has the activity light in green. The server number one has the activity light in uh, amber. So we recover the server number one, but server number two, even though it's a secondary, is now the active device, and server number one is the secondary uh, device. So if I wanted to revert that and reverse that, and make the server number one again the active device, what I would need to do is resend that file into, uh, into the system. All right? So I'm going to disconnect from here one second. And you saw that even though I added this compressor and this compressor was not in a redundant, uh, a redundant block, and we can check that again, I didn't check redundant, it was actually placed in that redundant pair. Uh, so that proves that basically even even if we don't not necessarily everything that is not redundant it's not going to be redundant and the and the main reason for that is that when we place a block if there's no other dsp we're going to place those dsp blocks in the redundant in the redundant pair and to demonstrate this what i'm going to do is that i'm going to actually swap one of these uh blocks i'm going to uh, um or actually i'm going to do something even better uh, remember that in in my in my little uh, in the equipment that I have here, I do have a Tessera Forte BI. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go here to um, document settings, server mode. I'm going to do combine, and I am going to add now a Tessera Forte BI. And in these blocks, I'm just going to make a couple connections so it is happy. Uh, oops. So I'm just going to connect this here, and I'm going to connect this there, and I'm going to connect this here. And the only reason that I'm making those connections is so it will compile and it's not going to be unhappy with me. Uh, but the other thing that I want to do is that actually I'm going to take this out and I'm going to delete this. I'm going to bring this output here. I'm going to connect this one here and oh. And I'm going to grab this output that is from the Forte, and I'm going to put it right here. All right, so now I'm going to compile this, and a couple of things are going to change. And you can see now that there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, AVB paths. So from unit number one, I'm jumping to unit number two, I'm jumping to unit number four, I'm jumping back to unit number two, and then I'm jumping back to unit number four. So in this case, Unit number two is still the redundant pair. We can actually go here to my equipment table and see that my redundant pair is unit number two and unit number three. So unit number three is not going to show up in any of these blocks. So anything that is in unit number two is going to be redundant in the re redundant pair. My unit number four is my forte. So in this case, since I already have some extra processing, then the compiler is completely respecting my decision of what blocks are going to be redundant and which blocks are not going to be redundant. So that's why this matrix and this level that are the only redundant blocks that I have are the ones that are placed in, device, in, in, in the second device, while the other ones, the tone generator, the compressor, and all these meters that I didn't set to redundant are actually set to be in the, uh, the CR40. So if I tested that, pretty much the same thing would happen. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to set all these meters, I'm going to set them to the redundant pair, and I can, I can do that. I think that I can do that easily here from the uh, property sheet. So I can go to property, and it says redundant. I can change that to true, and I'm going to make this tone generator also. I'm going to make it uh, redundant. All right, so I'm going to compile this, and that's going to simplify. Oops, it only... Okay, so now you can see that the matrix, the level control, and all these blocks down here are redundant, but that 
compressor is not. So I'm going to uh, send, I'm going to first go to system uh, equipment table and I'm going to add the Forte to my list and I'm going to send that into my system. There we go. So I'm back online. Uh, I have meters. And you can see here that I have signal even though it's going from unit one, well, from unit two to uh, unit two, uh, staying in the server. And this one is going through the Tessia Forte. Uh, and I have all the, the, uh, the other meters. So now, obviously, if I were to unplug one of the servers, uh, on the redundant pair. Right now I can see that the server number one is back to being the active device. If I unplug this device, uh, basically I wouldn't lose any signal because in that case, all these blocks are actually going to are redundant, so it will jump to the other one. And you say, well, what happens with the compressor? The compressor is not in a redundant pair, but that is because, well, it's in the Tessia Forte. So as long as the Tessia Forte doesn't fail, nothing would happen. But if the Tessia Forte fails, actually, the signal will not propagate and I lose signal in these two meters right away. And that is because, well, that compressor is not part of, a, of the uh, redundant pair. All right, so if I plug it back in, I guess at some point when the, when the, uh, when the TCA Forte comes back up, it should come back online. All right, now, as I said in the beginning, uh, or a moment ago, if this block I never set it to redundant, but in the first place it was actually placed into the redundant pair because, well, I didn't have any extra DSP devices out there. There was no other Fortes, there was no other server, server I/O. The moment that I added a, um, a Tessia Forte, then it actually respected that it was not set as redundant and it placed that uh, block in uh, that Tessia Forte. Now, that being said, and if I can place that block, it was placed in the device, it's inherently redundant. The other thing that I could do is that if I grab this block and I change it and I move it to unit, uh, to the server, and then I fix it, uh, oops, and then I fix it in that unit, even though it's not redundant, this block is going to be inherently redundant as well. So now, if I compile, I can actually see in the compilation that all these three blocks are in device ID 2, so that they are inherently redundant. Still, this block is not checked as redundant. So once we set one block to be redundant, we create that redundant pair, and then any block that is redundant will be in the redundant pair, or we can fix allocate to the redundant pair, and that will pretty much do the exact same thing. So, oops. So to summarize, there's a couple of little things that we need to remember when we're doing the uh, when we're doing uh, redundant pairs. Uh, on the DSP side, all blocks that are set to redundant will be allocated to the redundant pair. So that is automatically. If you set it, if you check that little redundant check mark, it will basically be it's going to be placed in that redundant pair. Now, non-redundant blocks may be or may not be allocated to the redundant pair. That depends on what else is on the file. So they will be allocated to the redundant pair if there's no other servers available. If there's no other means of processing, that, those blocks are going to be allocated to the redundant pair. And this is happening because remember that the compiler is looking for the cheapest solution. So it's not going to add extra DSP because you didn't check a block that is not going to be redundant. Uh, and if I grab a block and fix allocate it to a redundant pair, then that block is going to become inherently uh, redundant. Now, you might say, well, okay, that is directly from the server's perspective. And in this case, we were communicating via implicit AVB to the Forte and to the remote expander. So what happens with those connections? What happens with the I.O. in the server? Remember that the server can have two cards. So you can have one AVB initially uh, you need to have at least one AVB, but you can have a combination, so you can have one AVB and one Dante, one AVB and one Cobernet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So audio networks is going to depend on the um, on the media networks being uh, being used. 
uh, on the input side is actually pretty easy because since one server is active and the other one is in standby, both are actually receiving the same signal, so it doesn't really matter. So instead of sending signal from one, we basically we have both servers uh, receiving signal. So the input side is what handles those input devices. On the output side, it depends. It can be handled directly by the redundant pair, or it must be handled by the receiving device. And this depends directly on the on the uh, on the protocol that we're using and what we're connecting to. Uh, so in this case, what we're looking at is all those connections. Basically, we're looking directly at the ports. Uh, so whether we have ADD ports, we have uh, Dante or Cobra ports in the server. How do they work? And this is actually directly on the blocks themselves, right? So. And in this case, if we're talking about AVB, we need to talk about both implicit and explicit. If we're using implicit AVB, uh, let's say input expanders or output expanders, uh, the input expanders, what would happen is that we create a single AVB stream that is coming in from the input expander and it's being listened by both servers. So that happens automatically, that happens behind the scenes. Uh, we don't have to change anything and actually that's exactly what happened here. For something I don't have a, a signal connected directly to my uh, uh, to my XIO but pretty much this uh, expander is just sending an ABB stream that is being picked up by both the primary and the secondary uh, the secondary servers. On the output side what we do is that both ser servers are actually offering a uh, uh, are offering a stream uh, so those two streams are going to have a different ID and the expander is going to be listening only to the active server stream so the uh, since the active server is actually being the proxy for the output expander we tell the expander okay you're listening to this particular stream if the active server fails then what happens is that the proxy the, the standby proxy becomes the proxy for the remote expander and we'll tell the expander, okay, now you're listening to this stream. So the, so the server is actually the one telling that remote expander, now you need to switch and you need to be listening to this other stream. So in this case, in, in the case of implicit ABB, it is handled directly by, uh, by the servers. Now, when we're talking about explicit, it is a little bit different because basically we just have an ABD input and an ABD output, but we don't know what is out there. So we cannot proxy anything that is out there. So on the input side, it's pretty much the same way that we do it in, um, it's pretty much the same way that it's done with the, uh, um, with the, with the input expander. The only difference is that in the real ABB controller, we need to send that third party ABB stream to both servers. So we need to make certain that both servers are actually listening to that um, to that stream. And we're going to see that we're going to we're going to we're going to look at that in, uh, in in just a little bit. And on the output device, uh, both servers will create a unique ABB stream that can be routed using the ABB controller. So in this case, for ABB.1, if they're if they're in the redundant pair, what would happen is that we're going to create and you're going to see in Reader there's actually two ABB streams. So in that case, you need, the listener has to be able to either uh, receive those two streams and mix them together so you get the signal out whether one is active or the other one is active, or the streams must be rerouted after a failure. So in this case, we're just sending two streams, and what happens after that basically depends directly on the receiving device on how, how that is handled. In the case of Dante, uh, it depends directly uh, on the sentence in that Dante controller. And Dante is very peculiar on the way that it does uh, redundancy because all that is handled directly by the interface. So the standby device pretty much just mutes the Dante inputs and Dante outputs. Um, and so the Dante transmitting device the, uh, just sends, uh, yeah, will send the, uh, the flows directly to both servers in the redundant pair. So a Dante transmitting device, what we'll have to do is fan out in the device uh, uh, or 
basically the flow has to be made uh, multicast. So we need to make certain when we're creating a, a redundant Dante input inside a server that the Dante transmitting device is either fanning out and sending to both devices or we need to make that flow multicast so it actually is being received by both servers. On the, on the receiving side, basically, if we're sending Dante out from a redundant output block, um, pretty much what will happen is that uh, the receiving device will have, to, will have to receive those two flows and mix them together into one, or you will have to reroute in Dante, in Dante control. And finally, Covernet is actually the easiest one of all of them because we just create bundle numbers that are set from the inputs and the outputs, and those are copied exactly to the standby server. When the standby server becomes the active server, pretty much uh, they take over, it's muted and muted, so there's absolutely no changes, there's nothing else to set. So actually, Covernet is the one that is the easiest to, uh, uh, to set. Uh, somebody's asking if we can make two Fortis a redundant pair without having a server or, redu uh, or if redundancy is only available on servers. No. Any time that you make redundancy, redundancy happens only on servers. Uh, redundancy is not available on the CF Forte or uh, server IOs. All right. So all these redundant IOs, actually, we can see that. Uh, if, let me go back to the uh, to the software one second. If you look at this one, basically, you don't even need to uh, tell them that they're going to be redundant. The moment, actually, uh, or if you look at inputs and outputs. Input and output blocks, you cannot set them as, uh, as redundant. Uh, but that is handled directly by the server because those are implicit ABB. But if we have ABB inputs or ABB outputs, we actually have the, the, the capability of setting them redundant. And when we set them redundant, what it means is that these ABB inputs and outputs are, are going to be in the redundant pair. And they will behave as I just explained. The same thing happens with Dante inputs and outputs, they can be redundant. And the same thing happens with Covernet inputs and outputs, that they can be redundant. Now, bear in mind that the server can only have two network, uh, two media network cards. So you can have two ABB, you can have a Dante and a Covernet, or uh, ABB and, and Dante, etc., etc. So if you were to have a system or you needed a system that is that you want redundancy and that system requires all three networks, ABB, Dante, and Covernet, you're going to end up with four servers because you're going to need two servers uh, so you can host all those, uh, all those cards. So that is something to, uh, to keep in mind. All right. So now that is the way that we handle the input and output block. So that is pretty much before we even connect a cable to these servers. And now we're going to actually look at media network redundancy because it's not well. Those blocks are going to behave in a specific way depending on how we're connecting them outside. And, 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 and this depends a lot on what we're trying to do. So all media network interfaces have a secondary port. Um, and, well, I'm still talking about um, the CR server, the CR server, and the CR amplifier. So, uh, Tessia Forte doesn't have uh, a secondary port. It ha does have an AB, can have an ABB port, but it's not a, it doesn't have a secondary port. Uh, and these ports, depending on the type of protocol and network topology, they will support what we called um, uh, cable redundancy and network redundancy. I'm going to explain what's the difference between cable redundancy and network redundancy. And in any of these cases, if you can have network redundancy or cable redundancy without having server redundancy. So one thing doesn't imply the other, okay? Certainly you can use both at the same time. So you can actually have servers that are a redundant pair that are commuting over AVB and have the AVB network also be a redundant network. So in that case, if the server fails, you have a backup. Or if the network fails, you have a backup, or if a cable fails, you have a backup. So, but those are kind of like two different pieces of the puzzle. So now we're kind of like moving and we're looking actually outside of the devices. So the difference between cable and network redundancy is how you connect them together. We call cable redundancy when you have connections between the primary and secondary, but they're going to the same switch. 
So in this case, if one of those cables fail, you still have communications between the devices. But if the switch is the one that fails, you're going to lose communications between the devices. So that's only cable redundancy. Network redundancy is actually when you have two network switches. So in this case, if a cable fails, nothing happens. If a switch fails, you have a redundant network to keep that signal, uh, that signal flowing. Now, in some installations when network redundancy is required, uh, one thing to keep in mind or to think about, because actually we were having this discussion here in the office uh, yesterday, is that if you are doing either cable redundancy or network redundancy, uh, you have to think about where those cables are running. And uh, I'm not sure if here in the States uh, there is any type of um, uh, any type of uh, indication of how this wiring has to be made. I know that in Europe when you're doing the redundancy, uh, those network paths, basically where you run the cables, actually have to be separated. For instance, imagine that you're running all your cables over a uh, over a tray, but basically you have the primary and secondary running on the same tray, and you run that tray with a forklift. Well, you lost the primary and the secondary, so the cable redundancy didn't really work. So that would work only if those cables and those networks are actually separated. So if something fails in one, it's not necessarily going to cause a failure in the second one as well. So usually that means also that those switches need to be in completely separate places. So if one switch fails, let's say, I don't know, there's a fire or something like that, the other network will still be safe. So those are little things to consider when you're considering either cable redundancy or network redundancy. So now in our little diagram, what we're looking at is actually at the networks. Okay, so we're going to look at how we communicate uh, when we're using either cable redundancy or network redundancy with remote inputs and outputs, with the serial amplifiers, with AVB devices, covering devices, and Dante devices. And when I say remote inputs and remote outputs, I'm not talking now about expanders, okay? Uh, I'm talking about probably using like a survey or something like that, because remember that the expanders, they don't have to, um, they don't have a secondary AVB port, so they cannot participate or they will not work in a, a, a a cable redundancy or network redundancy in AVB. So those remote inputs, although I'm calling them remote, they cannot be remote expanders. But you could have a server I.O. a server I.O. that is populated with input and outputs and use that as an remote I.O. device into your system. So that's why I put remote inputs and remote outputs. So I'm going to start with AVB. Basically, it supports both cable and network uh, redundancy, so we can either do one or the other. Uh, now, whenever you set this up, uh, it's not that one network is active and the other one, uh, the other one is not. In the case of ABB, both networks are active at all times. So, uh, not only that, in, actually, when we are using network redundancy in ABB whether cable or network redundancy, we might actually have some streams that are using the, uh, the primary network while some others are using the secondary network. So uh, there's no balancing or any table that says how they're set up. It's basically the card decides if, if we're going to use the secondary or the primary, and once, once it's established, it will keep that one. If that fails, it's going to try to jump to the, uh, to the other one if the other one is present. And all the clock propagation is, gone, is done through the card. So the card actually manages to keep those two networks in sync. So once you connect them, basically, they know that basically there's two interfaces and it's part of the entire system. So we're just duplicating the interfaces. So clock, clock propagation is actually done correctly. Now, the behavior depends on if we're doing implicit AVB or explicit AVB. Uh, so starting with implicit, all implicit streams support cable redundancy by default. So whether you are connecting two cables to a server or not, all implicit AVB streams do support cable redundancy. So if you plug the second cable, you're going to have redundancy on the AVB network right away. So you don't have to do anything, and that is actually managed directly by the card. Uh, so if you have uh, if you have uh, one single network, basically you're going to generate two different um, 
uh, two different streams uh, and pretty much one is going to be on each of the networks. So you're going to have one stream that is flowing on the primary network and one stream that is flowing on the secondary network. Now those two streams, as I said before, are active at all times. The only difference is that only one is muted and this is decided by the card. So and it could be the primary or it could be the secondary. There's no way to know which one it is, but pretty much one is working and the other one is not doing anything. And if we lose one, the other one takes over. Now, so that means that either or both networks can be used at any given time. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that streams don't traverse networks. So a primary stream or a stream that is, work, is flowing through the primary network will not be a listen on the secondary networks and vice versa, right? So if something fails on the primary, we switch to the secondary network. We need to have a full path in the secondary network. Um, the CS expanders, as I said before, and the CS Fortes, they don't support cable redundancy. So and that is because, well, we have only a single ADB port. And since they have a single ABB port, that port is inherently a primary port. Well, that means that they can only transmit and receive on the primary network only. Uh, so they would need to be connected on the primary network. All right, so even before I jump to uh, explicit, I'm actually going to jump here into my TCS software. Uh, and I'm going to go here to my equipment table. I'm going to reset all my devices. And I am going, we're going to do something, we're going to do something interesting here. All right, so I just clear all that. I'm going to start with a brand new file. And what I'm going to do is that I am going to add uh, signal generators. I'm not going to make them redundant. I'm just going to put uh, this stone generator in um, uh, and I'm going to add a, well actually I need two of them. And I'm going to add a Tessia Forte, oops, I did this again, let me go back here to Tool options, document setting, server mode. So I'm going to add my Tessia Forte VI. And what I'm going to do is that I am going to, to wire this to here, but I'm going to put a meter that is going to be in this Tessia Forte. Uh, let's say peak meter. Uh, actually, I'm going to duplicate this one. I'm getting a little bit confused on what I'm trying to do here. Um, and then this stone generator is going to be placed in the in this one, and I want to add it to. Uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. One second there. Okay. And this one, I want it to go to uh, no, not really. Uh, let me think. I lost my trail thunder. I had a file that I was doing. Let me see if I can open this. Let me just one second. All right. So that's what I want to do first. All right. So what I'm going to, what I want to do is I want to put uh, two tone generators. I want one to be in a forte and the other one to be in a server. And I want to transmit to both. So let me erase this because I'm doing something strange here. Start again from the beginning. I'm just going to put that server. I'm going to make a couple of connections here. So this is happy with me. So it doesn't complain. And then I'm going to put, uh, like I can probably do that manually. So 
what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put a couple of meters, uh, audio meters. I'm going to put two channel meters. And I'm going to connect this tone generator, oops, this tone generator to one of them, this one to the other one. And then I'm going to duplicate this and do that. So in these meters, I'm receiving those two tone generators. I'm going to just compile this for one second. It's going to put everything in the TCA Forte VI. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to my equipment table and I'm going to force to add another unit. So I'm going to add one of my servers. And then what I can do is that I can fix the, these blocks and I'm going to fix one uh, in my TCA Forte. And I'm going to tell it to stay there. And this one, I am going to put it in the server and I'm going to fix it there. And I'm going to do the same thing with the meters. I'm going to keep one in the um, in the Forte and the other one, I am going to move it to the server. So if I compile this, you're going to see that basically we have ADB path from this tone generator to the first channel and ADB path from this tone generator to the second uh, to the second channel. All right, so now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to just uh, go here to my equipment table and I am going to assign my serial numbers and I'm going to send this one second. And right now I only have my primary network uh, connected. Uh, so if I put these meters here, and I start my generators, and what I'm going to do is that this one, I'm going to set it at a different level so you can see the... So there's the two tones. So you can see that basically both meters are showing exactly the same, even though we're passing signals through, the, through ABB. Now those are all implicit ABB. So right now, let me tilt that camera a little bit higher. All right. So this is my the switch that I'm using. So all the gray cables are control cables. These two first is the uh, Forte and the and the expander, and these are the ones that are going to my my server. So I only have primaries. I only have one single switch. So obviously, if I unplug, uh, no, it's not this one. If I unplug the um, the ABB from one of, from the server, I see that I lose one side of those meters because, well, I don't have ABB traffic. If I plug it back in, it should reestablish by itself in just a little bit. Once it negotiates and stuff, it sh let, you see that it, come, it came back up and the other one should come back up pretty shortly. If I pull the cable from the Tesia Forte, the same thing, the same thing would happen. So now I have here the um, secondary ports of my uh, of my servers, and what I'm going to do, I don't know which one is which, but I'm just going to connect both of them to the same switch. All right. So now my servers are actually going, and they're going exactly to the same um, to the same switch. So now, if I unplug this, uh, that should not have happened because I actually forgot half of what I need to do. My bad. We do see. I need to actually set up. Uh, I don't know. Edit parameters. You cannot see that because basically the failure is going to be always the same thing because we have one device that supports cable redundancy and one that doesn't. So that is the problem. So I cannot see I cannot see the difference. So what I need to do is add a third block uh, that is going to be allocated to the third server. Uh, so and this one uh, will go here. And this one will go here. All right. So now, I was forgetting that I need to actually add a 
another server. So I'm going to add the other server. Okay, and this one is going to be allocated to unit number three. And this is going to be allocated to unit number three and also true. So now I'm going to compile this one, one second and you can see, well, we have three devices. Uh, I'm going to set these serial numbers and send that to the device. Now it should actually work as intended. So I'm so right here I can see that I have my three meters. I'm gonna actually this one, I'm going to set it even a little bit lower, so you can see the difference. Uh, so now I have both servers and the Tessera Forte, uh, and the Tessera Forte, and I am passing audio between all of them. So I have each tone generator, there's one in the Forte, one in one server, one in the other server, and same for these meters. So we can actually monitor if we lose audio on one or, or cut ABB on one, what would happen. Now, on this side, this cable here is the, uh, the Tessera Forte. So if I unplug this one from the switch, I would lose, I lose a tone generator uh, from, the, um, from the Forte. And you can see here that in this firm's meter, I can see that, but I can actually, uh, I'm not getting the tone generator in either of the servers, and neither of the tone generators from the other servers is getting to the Tessera Forte. So basically, the Tessera Forte has only one way to get in, which is, oops, I forgot to put the camera, uh, which is basically using the ABB. If I put that ABB back, that should recover, and we should get back our signal. So you can see that now they recover back here and they should show up in these two meters uh, momentarily. All right. Let's wait until it comes back up. So there they are, so the system is back normal. Now these two cables here, the blue ones, are my primaries from the two servers. If I disconnect one of them, you can see that the um, the, uh, since I disconnected the primary, you can see that the Forte is actually not receiving unit number three, but unit number two is actually receiving all those, uh, all those uh, streams. So that means that the tone generator from unit number three is actually using the secondary port to get to unit number two, and we're getting that right here. But since the Forte doesn't have a secondary port, we lost that communication here, all right? Also, the... Um, the Forte is not getting to unit number three, uh, and that is because based the cable because I lost the primary on unit number three. So in between the two servers, it recovered because basically we have the secondary. And even if I disconnect the secondary, the, the other primary port, I, now I don't have in either of the primary ports. You can see that I still have communi full communications between the two servers on the secondary network, but the the CF Forte is actually isolated because I don't have a secondary network. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I am actually going to move these two secondary ports and I'm going to put them in the other switch. So now I have my primary network is working on one switch. My secondary network is on another switch. And if I disconnect my Forte here, well, you can see again that I lose my meters and my signals for the Tessera Forte. I'm going to plug this in the, in, the, in the secondary network. And you're going to see that we can wait, and that will not appear there. And that is basically because the Tessera Forte is not talking on the primary network. So it, there's no way for us to transfer that and say, oh, this one that is actually on a primary network will be passed on a secondary network. Uh, so we can wait as long as we want. That is never going to happen, and that is because basically the stream that is coming from the Forte is assigned on the primary network, and these two are in the secondary network, and those streams are not going to pass. If I plug it back in in my primary network, 
I should get that back and it should come back up. You see that it, these two just came back up and these two should come back, back up uh, momentarily. All right, now in the case of uh, explicit ABB, things change a little bit because explicit ABB, they can support both cable redundancy and network red, uh, cable redundancy and network redundancy. Uh, and it is, it is an option. Um, remember that they don't have to be on a redundant pair, but when I place an ABB block in the property sheet, I can actually select if they're going to be using cable redundancy or not. By default, it's set to false, so that means that they are not cable redundant. So when you put an ABB.1 block by default, they would behave exactly the same way as the uh, Tessera um, uh, 4. So I was saying with the explicit ABB, uh, cable redundancy is actually um, is uh, is actually an option. Now the behavior is going to be exactly the same as uh, implicit ABB, but all the streams must be routed in ABB um, in ABB controller. So I'm going to go back here to my file. Uh, I'm going to disconnect. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to keep these uh, tone generators. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I am going to create these. Uh, I'm going to separate. Actually, let me all break all this stuff up one second. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to do it now with explicit ABB. So what I'm going to do is that I am going to put three ABB.1 outputs, one for each device. Uh, so this one is going to be here. I'm going to move these blocks here one second. I'm going to connect this there. And, and here in the property sheet where it says use cable redundancy, I'm going to set it to true. And I am going to allocate this in the, uh, it's not allowing me to allocate it in the, this is not redundant. Uh, oh, correct. Uh, it's not allowing me to allocate it in the Forte because basically the Forte doesn't have uh, cable redundancy. So this is going to be now in the Forte. I'm going to set to yes. I'm going to connect this one here. This one I want it allocated into the server and I want cable redundancy set to true. And I'm going to put this one here. And this one, I am going to put it in the server. And I'm going to set cable redundancy also set to true. So I'm going to move this a little bit there. Let me arrange this a little bit. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three ABB inputs. Right, so I'm going to duplicate that, I'm going to put, so pretty much instead of doing implicit ABB as I did one second ago, I'm now going to do explicit. So this one I'm going to allocate to the Forte, and it cannot be redundancy, basically it cannot support that because the Forte doesn't support cable redundancy. But these ones on the servers, they can, so I'm going to turn on cable redundancy. And the same thing for this one. So I'm going to set this on the second thread, true and true here. And then I'm going to make my connections the same way that I had before to my meters. So I can see all, uh, and uh, well, actually, uh, yeah. Oops, no, there's something. What am I doing here? Oh, second. Second. All right. So now I have pretty much the same thing. The only thing that I'm going to uh, 
I am going to name, rename these streams. Uh, so the forte, I am going to call it uh, forte TX. This one, I'm going to call it server one TX. This one is going to be server oh, two TX. I think that I need, I cannot have spaces here. It doesn't, I don't think. And these ones, this is going to be Forte Rx, and I don't want to leave a space there. And this is going to be Server 1, uh, one Rx, and this is going to be Server 2 Rx. So now I'm going to compile this, everything is fine, and I'm going to send this in again. All right, so now I can open my meters. And in this case, well, I don't have signal yet, and that is because, well, these are AVB.1 uh, streams. I need to, uh, oops. I need to uh, connect them with the Riddle controller. So, in this case, I still have primary ports of all my devices in my primary switch and secondary ports only on the servers because the, the Forte doesn't have a secondary connected on the secondary switch. So what I'm going to do, so I'm going to go here, I'm going to open my Riddle controller, make, make it a little bit smaller, and I can see that I, I can see all my, all, all, my, uh, all my devices. Let me arrange this a little bit better. So I'm going to go here to connection management, and I can see all my, uh, all my devices. Uh, so, if I open here, uh, I need to refresh connection state. Oh, that right, right there, there we go. So here I have my uh, my Tessera Forte TX, my server one TX, server one uh, TX, and the server two. And notice that I actually have. Even though I created one single block for my receives, I actually have two receives. So I have server one Rx, server one Rx, server two Rx, server two Rx. So it creates automatically a um, a secondary uh, a secondary stream when we do cable redundancy. So in the case of uh, uh, of explicit, actually you can see it in Riddle because we're creating this uh, this manually. Second Rx, this one is not showing as a redundant, I'm missing something here. Uh, one of them is not showing as redundant, oh, this one here is not redundant. There we go. All right, so let me go back to my Riddle. All right, so now uh, we should plan refresh. All right. Uh, <clears throat> to refresh this so I can see all the connections. Uh, there's my Forte, my two to six, my, there's our, my, all my strings. All right, so perfect. So now I can see that 
the CR40, since it doesn't support uh, cable redundancy, I have only one transmitting stream and I have one receiving stream. But on the, on the server side, I actually have both. Now, for this one to work, basically, we need to make certain that routing is done correctly. Now, if the CR40 can transmit, uh, I want to transmit, uh, I can transmit either to one of the servers or to, or, or to both of them. But if I lose the transmitting device, pretty much I lost, um, I lost that signal. Now, I can actually manually, in this case, since it's an ABB.1 input, I could actually set it to receive on both sides. So if I have it like this, that is basically from the 40, it's actually going only to one of the networks. Um, and let me check, uh, make certain this is... Uh, it is okay so yeah so this one the one on the left is the primary so now if i grab my little camera here let me see if i can put everything together uh there we go kind of yeah all right so in this case or actually right you can put it right here from my tesia forte i'm sending on the primary to the first server or the second server so now if i disconnect anything here on the primary i can see that signals get lost all right. If I disconnect that one, the same thing happens. If I were to disconnect the, um, if I were to disconnect the Tesla Forte, uh, pretty much the same thing, uh, the same thing would happen, uh, would happen again, and pretty much I would lose the signal going into both of my devices. Now, oops, come on. What's going on here? Lost connectivity for some reason. Let me connect back to my system. Now one of the one of the things that I can do is that since these are now in explicit AVB, I can actually send this Tesla Forte transmit and actually send it also to the secondary. And if I send it to the secondary, nothing is going to happen. But what is what is happening here is that even though it's coming, it, it's coming on the primary, I'm also trying to send it to the, um, to the, to the secondary port. The only problem is that now this is only for cable redundancy. So if I unplug this one, you can see that I still lose the streams because I lose that meter. And if I unplug the other one, the same thing happens. I'm losing them. And the only reason that what I'm losing is that this stream is connected on the first switch only if there's no connectivity on the second. So this is only cable redundancy. And you can see that actually I cannot traverse the network. So for this to work, these two secondary ports would have to be connected on the same switch or I would have to interconnect those two switches um, together. And actually I can do that. I can move this and put them in the same switch. And if I do that, if, wait until it comes back up. If I do that, now if I unplug one of these, that signal should remain. You can see now that even though I unplugged, I still have the signals getting in into my, uh, into the, into the, um, into the servers because the the, the, um, the transmit is actually transmitting on the secondary as well. So I'm getting that signal still coming uh, coming in. So I'm going to connect all these back again. Here, here. Now, why are you giving me so much errors? So I'm trying to establish that one more time. There we go. Now, in the case of the um, of the servers, actually, if you are doing cable redundancy, 
uh, since these are uh, in, um, since these are um, explicit AVB, what you will need to do is make certain that you are checking the right the, the right things to the right things. So, for instance, primary will go to primary, secondary to secondary, primary on the second to primary, and secondary to secondary. So this way, if I disconnect anything on my switch, that connections they should remain because now this is ensured that there this stream on server number one, the stream number that is on the primary network is reaching the second server on the primary network and the secondary is reaching the secondary on the secondary network. And this kind of like should clarify what is happening behind the scenes with the implicit. Uh, as you can see, each one goes to one particular network. So this stream can only be received here and this one can only be received here. We cannot automatically pass it to the other one. So that is what was happening with the in, uh, in the beginning. So in this case, if I bring my camera up and I disconnect one of my primaries, the only signal that I lose is going up to the Tessia Forte, but you can see that the servers are still communicating between themselves. There was actually no problem there. I didn't lose anything. Now, in this case, since I'm doing cable redundancy, if I lose one cable, that happens. If I lose both cables on the primary, nothing happens. I still have. Even if I lose the switch, I could still communicate between those two other servers because I have two independent networks. But if I lose the primary on one server and the secondary on the other server, I would actually lose communications between them because those streams are not crossing uh, between one, the, between the primary and the secondary network. All right? Now, Dante, it's a little bit different, uh, and Dante, remember that Dante is actually, uh, it was developed by Audinate, so we pretty much support exactly what, uh, what the a standard uh, Dante network would, uh, would support. And in the case of Dante, they only support uh, network redundancy. They don't support cable redundancy. And in the case that you do decide to do uh, uh, Dante redundancy, you need to physically and logically separated networks uh, to do it. So you cannot plug the, the primary and the secondary Dante cables to the same Dante switch. That will, that will just not work. Uh, not only that, the secondary network must be exclusive uh, for Dante. You cannot, um, you cannot use anything else on that, uh, on that network. So it has to be, it has to be completely, completely separate from uh, from one another. Uh, and the same as with ABB, Dante flows can traverse between networks. So the, it's going to be exactly the same, um, the same behavior. We're going to have a, uh, uh, any flows uh, that are in the primary network cannot pass to a secondary network and, uh, and vice versa. Right? So the way that it behaves is that whenever you create a Dante input-output block, uh, they are automatically duplicated to the secondary to the secondary network. So basically, there is a there is a there are straight copy. And in Dante controller, we'll establish the connections on the primary network only. So the secondary connections are made behind the scenes. So you don't even need to do anything. Those connections are done for you behind the scenes. Uh, uh, so in case, actually, the secondary network is not even visible in, um, in Dante controller. Uh, and whenever something fails, all the switching is actually done in the, um, is in, is done in the interface. So all that switching passing from one network to the other and all the stuff is actually done in the Dante network, uh, in, the Dante, in the, Dante now, the Dante card. So I'm going to go back here to my Tessio system one more time. I'm going to disconnect from here. Uh, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to recreate this, but I'm just going to use Dante. So I'm going to just delete my Forte because I'm not going to use it. Uh, so I'm going to delete all this. this. I'm going to have to rewire the bar, actually. Let me do all that stuff. It's going to be much easier. Start from scratch, actually. So I am going to... Uh, put a Dante output. Uh, 
Now I'm going to wire this here, and I'm going to make put this one here. And I'm going to put two Dante inputs. Oops. And then I'm going to put some meters again. And this is only, I'm doing this only between the two servers because, well, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, Dante in the, uh, in the forte, so I'm just going to remove that unit from there, and what I'm going to do is this block, this block, and this block are going to be allocated to unit number two, and I'm going to uh, uh, fix a unit, and this one, this one, oops, what happened? So I'm just fixing the blocks in the respective servers, so I have that, so I'm going to compile this. So I am going to send this configuration into the system. And right now I don't have a, I don't have my Dante network connected yet. So, but we're gonna, I'm going to wait until that is loaded. And I'm going to and I'm gonna make a little change in my uh, in my network. Uh, and I'm doing this just because it, I don't. I only have two switches, so uh, Dante doesn't does, doesn't play very well in the same switch with uh, AVB. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to just disconnect all my AVB. Uh, all my ABB from the switch. I'm going to leave just uh, control. And I'm going to use this little short cable just to jump ABB from one server, uh, from one server to the other. So I can have my, uh, my meter still working. So there. And here I have my uh, Dante and uh, my green is my Dante primaries, so I'm going to connect these two in one of the switches. And I am going to respect what Dante says. I'm going to connect the secondary on, this, on a different, separate, complete separate switch. So that is already connected. Uh, I can go here. Uh, that is strange because I shouldn't have... I'm going to go here to my Dante controller. And I guess that some stuff is already connected, it seems like. There's some stuff that was already connected for some reason, uh, so I'm going to, uh, okay. All right, so here in Dante controller, we can see, uh, uh, I forgot to change the names of these things, so let me open these blocks one second. I'm going to open Dante again, uh, Dante controller. So here I see I have out 1-1, one, one, out 1-2, one, out 2-1, out 2-2, two, two, and the same thing for the inputs. So I am going to look here on my outputs. I have output 2-1 and output 2-2 two, two first. So these are the ones on the, on the bottom. I need to make certain that they are received by one of these and one of these. So I'm going to go out one. I'm going to 
send uh, out to one to uh, uh, not this one in the same device so it has to be the other device so it will be so one to one and one to two uh, well actually I don't need this one because this one is not passing any signal so out to one so the um, the first channel here is going to in one two so it's actually going from this device to this device so I can see it that actually is appearing on the first meter and the other one this output here out one one I need to send it to uh, out, sorry out one one I need to send it to in to one so when I turn that on I actually have this as you can see I cannot see anything else that indicates that I would have that I have other networks uh, active or other other uh, things active so right now everything is running I can see my meters if I disconnect one of these cables you can see that the meters don't flinch they don't do uh, they don't do anything so Dante is actually doing all the switching by itself if I disconnect oops that one went away oh there it goes back again and they recover back again so I guess it was on the secondary uh, but then if I unplug this you can see well it goes out but it should record by itself so it's switching from one network to uh, to the other to the other network so it's actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do now if I uh, change uh, one of these cables and I'm not sure that is the first unit or the second that's the first unit and I unplug, I think this one maybe. Yeah, so up there I unplug the primary of one unit and the secondary of the, of the second unit. And that is exactly what I was saying. It's kind of in this case, I have primary of one unit, the secondary of the other unit, yet I don't have any signals. And that is because, well, the streams cannot cross. So the, the, the flows cannot cross one, one network to the, to the other. So it pretty much very very similar to the way that um, to the way that ADD uh, works, All right? So now it actually recovered and they are back and they are working working again. All right. And finally, Covernet is much more simpler than all of that uh, because Covernet does support both cable and network redundancy. Uh, and it relies on standard network practices for redundancy. So whenever you're doing network redundancy, uh, if you're connecting multiple switches and you're doing like a ring topology or something like that, you need to make certain that you're doing spanning tree protocol. So it's up to the network to make the switch between primary and secondary. So the interfaces, they don't do anything. Uh, all is done by the, um, by the network. So what that means is that there's no special settings required on any of the I.O. devices. So you just set up the uh, transmitting uh, bundle number and the receiving bundle number and uh, all the, the signal path is actually arranged directly in, uh, in the network by using standard network uh, protocols. Now, after that, we are way beyond what we can control or what we can see from Tessera. For up to, up to this point, it's basically stuff that is directly connected to Tessera and we can see. So we started with the DSP objects and we went to the actual interfaces on the border of the units and we went to remote devices that are actually, that can be on, on uh, distributed on, on the network. But what happens beyond that? And that, when you start talking about, well, what about microphones, uh, uh, program sources, amplifiers, loudspeakers, things like that. And there's, there can be a long discussion on what you can make redundant when you're talking about these things. For instance, can you make a microphone redundant? It's like, well, I don't know any microphone that is, uh, that is redundant. Uh, or can you make a loudspeaker redundant? Well, I don't know if you can make one redundant. I know that uh, you can actually put two microphones and put them in a mixer so if one fails you grab the other one so some of those mechanisms can be created but it's up to the integrator or to the designer to design a system that actually can have those mechanisms so 
can we talk about inputs, outputs, sources, destinations, control, and logic? And most of those, if you're creative, you can find a way that you can make it redundant in some, in some way. Depending on what it is, if you can find a way and, and how it works, if there's a way that you can make that redundancy to happen automatically or not. So, for instance, you could, in Tessera, you could grab an input and use a signal present meter. So, if you don't get a signal to switch to a different channel, um, or if you are not hearing a particular source, that uh, the same thing, you could switch to a different channel. When it comes to destination, it's a little bit more difficult because we cannot read what the destination is doing until, unless we have a loop back that comes back to us telling us what is the state of that destination. So, it's up for the destination to do to do that switching. And control and logic, same thing. Basically, there has to be a mechanism to, uh, to do that. Now, only one of the, the outputs that we can control is, uh, as I said in the beginning, that the serial amplifiers are coming. They do support redundant ADB. So all the stuff that I was showing you between the servers with, uh, uh, with uh, both uh, network redundancy and cable redundancy, uh, it's available, it's going to be available on the Tessera amplifiers. But the Tessera amplifiers, they do offer also analog failover. So they will be able to host an input card, and you can set that input card as an analog failover. So you can connect an analog signal into that amplifier, and if those of the ABB ports fail, or we're not receiving any ABB signals at all into the amplifier, it will automatically fail over to the analog inputs. So you have an extra layer of redundancy that is going to be available in the uh, in the Tessera amplifiers. Uh, so, as I said, in all those devices, inputs, outputs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if we can detect that a device fail, we, uh, we might be able to do something. And for that, we can create logic. We can do presets. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do. But it all depends on whether we can actually detect or know if we if something has failed and that part is not necessarily easy the other thing is that sometimes depending on the type of signal that we're trying to establish they might re-establish really quickly and sometimes they would uh, they would not so we can use things like signal present meters we can use uh, logic inputs control voltage things like that to actually detect uh, signals from the outside that will tell us the presence or if something is operating or or not. Uh, but as I said, basically at this point it's up to the programmer to create the recovery mechanism. So those, we don't have like particular blocks that automatically will say, oh, if I add this block, if one microphone fails, I will use the other one. No, that's basically something that has to be custom built for the, uh, for the application. So that's it for me today. So have a nice day and thank you very much.